trimming line, we learn the proper method to trim a hedge. The hedge should always be wider at the base than it is at the top. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership in the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we go on location with John Ball Extension Forestry Specialist to learn about hedges. We'll learn which tools are appropriate for trimming a hedge, plus when and how much material to remove. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call in is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist, John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist, and K.C. Jensen will not be with us this evening. So, <laughs> Helping answer the phone tonight are the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. We re are ready here to provide the description for your problem. And when you call in, make sure the problem that first appears and show us what is affecting it and all the surrounding plants and moisture and soil conditions that exist around that problem. First off, we go around the table to hear from our panel on what is currently happening with you in the area. So, John, what do you have for us for insects? Oh, I've got a good mix of things tonight. And I've, what I did was I just picked up some of the things that I've had, uh, a couple of things I've had some of the most questions about in the last week or so, and then something that we're going to see here pretty soon. So we're going to start out tonight with a four-lined plant bug. These are uh, pests in gardens at times, and they're this bright chartreuse and black bug. These are true bugs. We've got this orange head on them, and as you can see in the image here, they cause these little black spots to appear on leaves. Uh, it's the feeding damage that causes that spotting on there, and they get into a, a wide range of garden plants. They cause damage to even things like rhubarb that a lot of other insects won't touch. Uh, get onto any number of you know beets and carrots and peppers and pretty much if it's growing in your garden they might take a taste of it and, and they may be able to do some damage to it. One of the neat things about these that I find neat anyway, maybe other people don't, but um, this is a perfect example of one of those things that we consider to be a pest species but it also does a great job of helping control some burdock in some localized situations and so if you've got burdock issues out there Maybe you'd actually want to encourage some of these things. If you've got them in the garden, you're probably going to want to uh, try to do some tillage in the fall and again in the spring, try to reduce numbers of eggs and, and uh, real young uh, bugs that might be surviving in some of that soil at that time or on that soil. And then we've got some insecticides that can be used as well at this time of year. You want to put them on when you start seeing damage from these guys. They do a lot of damage in a hurry. so probably look at something like acephate or malathion as uh, some of the better insecticides to use against the four-line plant bugs. Uh, next one is not really a garden pest at all. The next one is a larder beetle and these are pests inside houses and I hear these described by a different number of names. Common name isn't all that important on these things but these eat 
anything that you can imagine, anything that you would think of as food, and a lot of things that you wouldn't think of as food. Uh, I've found these at times burrowing into the gypsum of drywall even and uh, trying to survive on some of that. And they can feed on cardboard and feathers and you know, dried animal skins, they get to be a problem in taxidermy mounts even and, and insect collections and you name it, if they can possibly eat it, they will. Control of the, the larder beetles comes down mostly to trying to uh, um, do a lot of deep cleaning and, and unfortunately since they're mostly an indoor pest, it's hard to use insecticides against them. Next image here, this is something, this is the one that I said, uh, so far we aren't seeing many of, but in the next couple weeks now we may see some of these around. This is actually a honeybee swarm on a tree. And it's about this time of year, usually coming up to about the 1st of July, that we start seeing swarms of honeybees at times in South Dakota. About half of the bees in a hive leave with the old queen. They'll rest on something like this temporarily while they look for a new home. And if you find something like this, the best thing you can do for them, unless you want them yourself, is call up your closest local beekeeper and ask them if they'll come take them away for you. Chances are they'll just come pick them up and get them out of there. If they won't do it, or if you just don't want to bother with something like that, the risk is that those bees move into a house. And if they get into the walls, I've got a picture here of one that was in the walls of a building, then what it comes down to is doing just this. This is from the inside of a building. It's a lath and plaster construction. You end up cutting a hole in the wall and having to remove those bees from the inside. So if you do see one of them hanging around, get out there and, and uh, call a beekeeper, have them take them away. They'll be happy to get them. A couple little questions for you. Burdock, you mentioned burdock. Can you describe that real quick if people think they may have it? What well, they look for? Yeah, burdock is that large weed. It's got the real large elephant ear type leaves out there. Uh, it gets that kind of a, a sticky seed to it. It's not really sticky in that sense, but it clings to a lot of things. And people will often tell me that they've got cockle burrs, and really what it is is it's burdock. It's a softer seed capsule to it. If you actually feel that, you can squeeze it easily. It's not like the true burdock, or like the uh, cockle burr that's quite a hard spiny one, but it does cling to fur of animals and clothing of humans. Um, real big leaves, looks kind of like rhubarb, and some people describe it as wild rhubarb. Yeah, like Velcro, those seed pods where yes. they stick to the clothes. Yeah. Okay. And honeybees, a uh, number of times we've had people call in too and say, do you know a beekeeper that could collect these bees and use them in their hives? But in most cases you prefer not to allow, or as beekeepers they don't, care for that, do they? For picking... Keep, keeping the wild bees and, and bringing those into their hives. In, in a case of a swarm like that, most beekeepers will be very happy to get them okay. because you can easily replace the queen that's there with a queen of your own and you end up with a hive exactly the way you want it. This is the proverbial free bees uh, and <laughs> most beekeepers are pretty pleased to get something like that. Alright, okay, <laughs> thanks John. Dave, what do you have for us tonight? Well, I was out taking pictures of McCrory this morning and I was going to send a bunch of pictures in to Brian and Lowell and I thought it's better to have the real thing because if you want to get your flower fix, come out to McCrory Gardens, now is the time to do it. Uh, the perennials are just in full bloom right now and I just picked a few, there's many, many more that are in bloom, but I, I tried to pick out a few that we could just talk very briefly about tonight. And of course, I'm going to highlight a couple that most people are familiar with and that's the iris. Uh, the iris are pretty much in full bloom right now. I've just got a couple different uh, tall bearded iris and a Siberian iris in here, and I think there's also a, a couple other varieties of iris in here too. Uh, they've been doing wonderful things out in the garden right now and are still performing pretty strongly. If we get some heavy storms, though, some of those are going to probably go down on us. Along with the peonies, uh, usually there's a break kind of between peonies and iris, but they're kind of blooming at the same time this year with the the uh, kind of a funky, cool spring that we've had this year. The flowering times are a little bit off, just like they've been with the woody plants in some cases. A few other plants that I brought along. Uh, this is a new one, relatively new one for us in McCrory Gardens. This is Sanguisorba. It has a very interesting kind of a reddish, burgundy-colored seed head. A uh, good perennial plant for us. We've got some Aruncus or goat's beard that's in bloom right now. This one we've got way too much of. This is uh, Valerian. Uh, we've got our own little nickname for it at McCroy Gardens, but I won't share that one with you. But it's kind of spread all over the place. The salvias are in full bloom right now. 
a variety of different colors of those. Got a little plant back here. This is Lady's Mantle, also in bloom uh, right now. That's one of my favorites, especially when we get this rainy weather. It, uh, the leaves kind of beat up all the moisture on them. We've got some uh, Baptisias of different sorts in here. We've got some white Baptisias, some yellow Baptisias that are in bloom right now. Threw a couple woodies in here for you, John. We got a honeysuckle that's in bloom right now. This is Lanistera sempervirens, mm -hmm. correct? And we've even got a few lilacs that are still in bloom. Some of the late lilacs are still coming out and really putting on a nice display. And you walk past that lilac collection, you just get those wonderful uh, aroma of the lilacs, along with like the iris and so forth. It's a great time to come out to the gardens and, and take in some of the beauty of nature and uh, get some ideas of something that you might want to try to plant in your own home gardens. I know the garden centers are still in stock with plants in most cases and there are many of you can find some of these potted perennials and so forth you can still plant them even now or not too late to put things out in the garden we're still trying to get our beds planted in McCroy we've gotten the last rain and kind of delayed our planting again so I'm hoping we can get back in the garden and do some planting over the next few days and get caught up okay say Dave on any of these would you deadhead anything that you have in your container there well, deadheading isn't a bad idea for most plants. Uh, it, it generally improves the appearance. In some cases, it's a good idea. I don't really have anything there in particular other than maybe that uh, valerian that you really want to deadhead because you just don't want it to spread anymore. Uh, there's some things that will spread pretty rapidly by, by seed, so deadheading them is going to help reduce some of that problem. So okay. it's a good idea to do it. It improves the appearance, and it also can, in some cases, help improve the vigor of the plant a little bit by not producing seed. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. John Ball, what do you have for us tonight? Well, as Dave mentioned, we've had a lot of cool, wet weather. That's delayed a lot of things, but it's also increased our disease problems. And right now, we're seeing a host of foliage diseases that are popping up. So I brought in a few pictures of some in. Uh, one of the more common ones we're seeing right now is ash rust. And that results in these beautiful blotches, yellow to orange blotches, on the leaves and on the petioles. Uh, this is the time of year where people start noticing it, and I'm afraid this year is going to be a bad year for it. Last year we didn't have much. But by the time you see this, people say, well, what can I do? Nothing. Uh, this would have to be sprayed in the spring just as the leaves start to open. And generally we don't recommend spraying because in most years we see very little of it or none. But this year with the continual cool wet weather, it looks like it's going to be another banner year for this disease. And then another one that I'm just starting to get samples in in the last week uh, is our peach leaf curl. Now, it's more of a novelty. Uh, I mean, if you're growing peaches in South Dakota, you've already got one strike against you. This is just the second strike, and it causes the leaves to become def uh, deformed in that. It looks a little uglier than normal, but other than that, hey, it's a peach, so uh, we deal with it. But the problem we're really going to be dealing with, at least those folks along the Missouri, and of course, is the flooding. And while they certainly have a lot of other things to be concerned about right now, when they do get back to their homes, uh, one of the things that they're going to find over the next year is decline of a lot of those trees. The worst time to have flooding for a tree is right now. Uh, trees have leafed out. Uh, the root system uses a tremendous amount of oxygen, something a lot of people don't realize. And if it's underwater, particularly if it's stagnant water, we get some of these backwaters. And if it lasts for several weeks, That'll be enough to start killing trees, and they won't die right away. Many of them will. They'll die slowly over the next year, and surprisingly, it's the larger trees you're going to have more problems with than the smaller trees. Uh, even down in Dakota Dunes, some of those very large cottonwoods, uh, I'm certain I'm going to get calls this fall and next spring uh, about these large cottonwoods that are beginning to decline and die. But, uh, and, of course, certain species such as cherries, any of your prunus, are very susceptible to it. They'll start dying probably about the time folks get back in their home. So to add to all their problems, when they get back and clean out the house and think everything's over, they're just going to get the start in terms of the damage we see on their trees. We had a question a couple of weeks ago as far as roughly how much, and I suppose it varies a lot between tree species, mm -hmm. but roughly how long can a tree be in standing water or water like this and before we get major damage? Well, you're right, it varies. And, and at the one end, we have uh, our conifers, and our cherries that even three or four days uh, flooded conditions are enough to kill them. 
Uh, in fact, we're already seeing a lot of conifer damage just from the wet soils we had last fall. So down in the dunes and in pier where you're actually having conifers in water and any of your prunus or fruit trees, they're going to be dying or dead by this fall. Then at the other extreme, we have trees such as willows that will withstand it very easy, and young cottonwoods can withstand it as well. Most trees are kind of in between the two. If the flooding uh, uh, recedes within another week or so, they'll probably recover, but if it's as long as they expect it to be, perhaps a month, uh, I expect to see a lot of widespread death of, of almost all the trees. Why the, why the mature tree, such as a cottonwood, more is an issue than a younger tree? Tremendous yeah. oxygen demands on those, on okay. those trees. And, and by small trees, we're talking trees that are five, six, seven inches in diameter. They'll probably make it. We saw this back in the 90s up with the flooding that occurred up in Roberts County and that. You can go and look, and the old cottonwoods died. But the young ones made it, and they came through. But you have places like Dakota Dunes, which is in a stand of mature cottonwoods and uh, they're not able to recover from something this as much as a, a younger no different than people you know something happens to your 20 you just pick it up and go on when you're 90 yeah it could be a problem <laughs> so no yeah trees are the same way okay thank you john so all right we'll get ready in the question saying you were talking about peach this one comes from sioux falls is there a best variety for south dakota uh freestone eating style and do you need two for cross-pollination and for peaches, yeah, right? Yeah, that's correct. Now, if you really want to grow peaches, the easiest way to do it is move to the peaches, not move the peaches <laughs> to us. Uh, Georgia, the peach state, does everyone get that? I mean, it's warm there, so go. But, you know, if you say, I just really like to be frustrated, uh, and so you want to grow a peach, uh, you only need one, all right? And uh, probably uh, contender or reliance are your best two, contender or reliance. And those will take temperatures down to about minus 20 or minus 25. And if it lives, it still doesn't mean you're going to have peaches because they bloom too early. So what I always suggest, if you're really trying to grow peaches, never, ever, ever plant them on the south side of your house, right up near your house, where it's going to pick up a little more heat in the spring, and then at night temperatures drop and we'll get the frost buds going. So plant them not where they're shaded, but at least not where they're exposed to bright, direct sun in the spring. And if you do that... I, I know some people get a few peaches every year. A lot of people see peaches every five or six years. Uh, mostly you're going to be buying peaches, okay. uh, but you could have a peach tree. And then warm weather causes it to come out of dormancy? And the flower buds, right. Yeah. They, one of our real problems with peaches is not that they won't survive. I, you can see peach trees in Murdo, but just that they won't flower, or the flowers will be killed by the frost. So anything you can do to delay the flowering is to your advantage. Actually, the best peach is that snow peach. The one that gets passed around, people pick up the, the, the seeds to it and plant it. And that'll grow, but you can't buy it in a store. You just got to pick it up. It's being passed around the state, you know. From, it's kind of like, uh, what, uh, I don't know, any of the cakes or something like that get passed around. Fruit cake, yeah, it's like fruit cake, a living fruit cake, if you want. Or zucchinis zucchini in the bread. fall, yeah, yeah, right, zucchini bread. <laughs> Okay, this comes from Lennox, asparagus, and it's more of a, a weed control question. Asparagus bed, lots of crabgrass, uh, how to control it. Can they use preen or any other pre-emergence herbicide on that? Well, if it is, in fact, crabgrass, you can use preen on it, but you want to get that down before the spears start coming up in the spring. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably more like the quack grass or brome grass that's coming in there, and that's going to be much more difficult to deal with. Uh, you really can't, there isn't really any good product that you can use to effectively control that grass without probably causing some pretty severe damage to the asparagus. So my best idea is in the spring of the year, and I don't know how big this patch is, but in the spring of the year when those shoots, of the, the grass shoots first start coming up, and if you see it early in the spring, it's definitely not crabgrass because crabgrass is just germinating now. But if you can get in there and kind of carefully dig in there with a small trowel or even a knife and kind of get some of those rhizomes loosened and pull those out of there, you can reduce it, but it's going to be an ongoing struggle. You know, now there are a couple of herbicides, just a couple, and they're hard to find at places, but they are labeled for homeowner use, that you can apply in the fall uh, to control the grasses. And if they go to a, uh, a place that sells pesticides, probably more than just one of the marts, but a uh, place that specializes in these, they may be able to find a product. They don't mind applying pesticides, but boy, you have to read and follow the label directions exactly so you don't kill the asparagus. But if you really have a big weed problem, you don't mind using herbicides. There are some, but they're fall applied to control it the following year. So at this point, 
you're out of luck. Okay. Astrid, John, it's 15 years old and they're in Arlington. Last spring when it was leafing out one year ago, there was a frost. Uh, they had very few leaves last summer. This spring, only a few leaves and a few branches. Any thoughts? Is it's dead. Uh, you know, it's, and, and again, uh, with ash, they do get a lot of problems. And we did have last year that, that frost knocked a lot of them back. And we had some knock back this year as well. So it, it just may not recover at this point or, or recover so poorly that you may be better off cutting it down and starting another tree. And obviously, if you're going to plant another tree, it shouldn't be another ash because there is that looming threat of emerald ash borer. It's not found any closer than the Twin Cities. And, you know, it may be a while before it arrives here, but the inevitability is there. So this might be a good opportunity to diversify the landscape, get rid of that tree, and plant something better. Okay. This one is clover in the lawn. Uh, it's taking it over. What do you recommend? That comes from Irene. Well, you can do a couple things management-wise. Uh, first of all, I don't know what they're doing as, for, as a fertility program, but providing a little extra fertility to the lawn, uh, mostly applied in the fall, but even a couple applications in the spring or the early summer, uh, you can help make that grass grow a little bit more vigorously. That's going to tend to outcompete the clover a little bit more. And I'd suggest in the fall of the year, uh, probably after we've had the first frost or so, try a, a, a broadleaf herbicide and give it a couple treatments with that, maybe about three or four weeks apart, you know, end of September, first part of October, somewhere in there. And that's going to help reduce it, but it's going to be increasing the fertility, probably increasing the mowing height somewhat, and then trying the herbicide applications to try to knock it out. And if, and if Mike were here, because uh, he talks about this quite a bit. He'd be with me. I've got clover in my lawn. I like it. And I know he does too. In fact, as he used to say, they used to put clover in, in lawn mm -hmm. seed mixes. Mm -hmm. but, but you're absolutely right. What Mike would, would say if he were here, in his absence, is that you're, you're just going to knock it back in the fall. And it's not anything that's going to eliminate it. So fertility, mowing height, and then the fall applications of the herbicide. Right. And, and expect to be doing this on a continual basis because it's not something you're going to eliminate. I've got clover in a lot of the turf areas at McCrory, and I don't really find it objectionable. It, it mows and it stays green. And Learn to problem. love it. Yeah. Learn to love it. <laughs> Toleration. <laughs> yeah, Toleration. We, Diversity. It. It's a yeah, good thing. Yeah, we, <laughs> we talked about that a few shows back, too. So. <laughs> well, uh, one time it was indicated that if you have a lot of clover, that might indicate that your nitrogen levels may be a little low. But is that right. increasing the nitrogen? Content Way of the out. soil is going to tend to diminish the amount of clover that you have. It doesn't, being that it fixes its own nitrogen in many cases, adding more nitrogen doesn't seem to really support its growth very well, so it'll kind of diminish a little bit. But if you've got a big clover problem, you're going to have a clover problem for a long time to come unless you get really serious and just rejuvenate the whole yard. Okay. Rapid City, uh, when can you tell us to uh, transplant rhubarb? You can tell them tonight, but the best time of the year, I think, is what they're asking here. And some tips on how uh, to do that. Simple explanation is what they said. So, Well, the simple explanation is the spring is probably going to be the best time for you to do that. Um, if you've got a, a patch or a friend has a patch and you want to divide some of that, just you know, make sure that you know where that patch is. So in the spring, as soon as you can get in there and work in the soil, the earlier the better, really. Just dig down. You're going to have some pretty massive crowns of those plants, just dig them out and get as much of the root system as you can and put them in a new, new location and plant them back at about the same depth they were growing before. Rhubarb is one of those tough perennial vegetables that is really tough to, to do it a harm, to do harm to it, although I lost mine that I planted originally in my garden because it got too wet. That doesn't like that, so find a good well-drained site for it. They know she used the term vegetable, so it's a vegetable but cooked and used typically as a fruit. Well, yeah. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the part that you eat is the petiole, which is a vegetative part of the plant, or as opposed to a fruiting structure. So, yeah, tomato, vegetables, fruits. Yeah. As long as you like it. <laughs> yep. Okay. As always, we encourage our viewers to send in either emails or surface mail questions and pictures of some of the samples they would like to have answered on the air and. Tonight's no uh, exception to that. We have a number of uh, that uh, have come in. This one comes to us from Crook, South Dakota. And they found this in the asparagus patch laying on the ground. It moves, the shell is hard, 
Green stuff oozes out when squeezed. Ooh, oh. So they maybe squeeze a little too hard for it to continue on. But uh, what is it, and do I need to be concerned about this? John Kefer, what can you tell us about this what one? What was it, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that is the right question, is what was it? Because if you're squeezing it hard enough, the green stuff is coming out, that's too hard to squeeze it. <laughs> this is actually a, a pupa of one of the moth uh, caterpillars. These things, uh, like a lot of those butterflies and moths, have a caterpillar stage. They pupate. Some are, enter into a cocoon of some sort or a chrysalis. Some just have this puparium that lays in or on the soil. And this is uh, most likely one of the hawk moths or sphinx moths um, found in a garden. It very well could be a tomato hornworm or would have been a tomato hornworm if you had let it complete its development. So you said pupate. For those that may not know that term exactly, what is that? Well, with, these, with certain insects, they go through what's called complete uh, uh, metamorphosis. They go from a larval stage through a pupal stage to the adult stage. And in that pupal stage, they actually reorganize all of their body tissues. They end up as kind of this goo inside of there, if you will, and everything reorganizes. You can't necessarily recognize one part from another while it's going on. And they go in, a, in this case, as a caterpillar, and they come out as a moth. And it's that time that's spent making that reorganization that's called the pupil stage. Very good. Thank you. This one comes to us from uh, Vermilion. Uh, these lilacs were planted about seven years ago, John, and are in full, John Ball, in our full sun. We're concerned about the bark on several of these bushes, and the pictures are of the ones most affected. The bushes are growing well, have abundant flowers in the spring, and the foliage is vigorous. The lilacs seem unaffected by this condition. Is there a concern? No, this is normal. This is what the bark is supposed to look like on a number of those uh, tree lilac cultivars. And so um, I kind of like the appearance of it. It gets a little mottled in that. So as, as they point out, the plant's doing extremely well. Uh, this, the way this bark is breaking is completely normal. So nothing you can do about it, or should do about it. It adds character. It adds squeeze. Don't squeeze it. <laughs> <laughs> don't squeeze the green stuff out. Yeah, don't squeeze the green stuff <laughs> yeah. out. Well, yeah. uh, the next one comes to us from Beersford. And this is a picture of a, a nice cutting that they took off a pussy willow tree. And it's rooted some nice roots on the bottom four to six inches of the trunk. I assume, well, they had it in water or something in that order. And can you give us some advice on how deep to plant it? How long a time ago I, uh, well, they planted one and it grew quite well, but uh, they'd like to know a little bit about what to do with this now to try to make it in and transplant it as a tree. Well, you know what? I wouldn't have pulled it quite out yet. Um, usually for my cuttings, I leave them in, that, in a pot for most of the summer and then I plant them out in the fall so they really develop a, a much better root system than that. I want something that literally fills a pot. So if it were mine, I would take them, put them in a pot of nice, nice light uh, soil mix or soilless mix uh, and let them root in there all summer long and then this fall after they drop their leaves then plant them out because that doesn't have quite the root system yet to allow it to compete in, in field soils. Okay. Now, on this particular one, they said they they had done one, this before, one of uh, another one, uh, and then a big wind came up and blew over and didn't seem to have many roots. Is that related to this, or would that be oh, yeah. that, more that would, growing conditions? Or Well, a combination, but that would be related to it. I mean, you take a plant like that, and while you can stick the cuttings out, out into the field, they just don't develop as well as putting them in a pot, getting a good root system developed, and then moving them out. So, so that could be a little bit of a concern with yep. that type. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Watercress from seed. Uh, they have it in the pots, and then the soil potted into, it filled up with water, was, was going good, is now turning yellow. How does she keep the plants uh, growing well? I have to admit, I've never grown watercress, but it sounds to me like maybe they're keeping a little bit too wet, and they might need a little extra nitrogen fertilization or something going on there, so I'd Try to dry them out a little bit, maybe give them a little shot of Yeah, they don't fertilizer. say anything about if they're, the pots have drain holes or anything in the bottom, and that yeah. might be something, too. To you get that sure. yellowing that, that typically relates to a nutrient deficiency, probably nitrogen is my guess in this case. Okay. John Ball, Ipswich, six foot tall, just finished blooming dogwood. Uh, is now a good time to prune, and how much, and can she cut that off? 
Well, for dogwoods, typically what we're looking for is that bright red or bright yellow bark. And because of that, we usually um, recommend dormant pruning for it so that it has a longer season to grow up. It's been cool and it just flowered. You could prune it, but I wouldn't take off more than a, a third or even a fourth of the stems. And where I prune them, it would be fairly close to the base. If the plant's in good shape, I would just wait really till this winter to do pruning and then take off a third of it. It'll come back more vigorously that way. So six foot tall, they'd take off two foot? No, 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 by a third, thank you. It's a third of the canes, not, okay. not a third of the height. <laughs> because then you're going to get that, as you well know, just suckering up at the tip. So uh, when we say take, take off a third, we mean if it's got six canes, you're taking off two of them, but you're taking them off within three inches of the ground. Okay, all the way to the ground. Take well, three the inches of the ground. Okay. It's, uh, uh, Ipswich, Linden, what variety of Linden is best for their area? Oh, for Ipswich? Yes. You know, one of the ones that I try and I really like is the uh, Harvest Gold Linden. Now, that has really interesting bark, and I, I think it's as actually rather attractive bark, a little different than the typical ones. Uh, it still has the little flowers to it, and it has a nice form. And it's certainly hardy. This uh, Harvest Gold actually comes from Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, so a little farther north than they are in Ipswich, and uh, it's a really nice tree. I like the fall color too, too hence harvest gold. Yeah. And should be available? Oh yeah, that's, that's been available for years. Okay, good. Thank you, John. Well, Garden Line met with John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist, uh, to learn about caring for hedges uh, during the summer. John begins our, last, our lesson tonight with identifying the correct priming tools, excuse me here, uh, for the job. So. John? Well, we don't normally do a lot of pruning in midsummer, but there is a type of pruning that definitely needs to be done at this time of year, and that's shearing our hedges. Shearing hedges is actually a summer long activity, and here's a couple of tips to make your, sure your shrubs look their best. First of all, when you're shearing, electric shears work the best, but the biggest and most important thing is to shear out. When you're going through and making your cuts, the head should always be wider at the base than it is at the top. By shearing in an outward motion like this, what you're going to do is make sure that the foliage at the bottom is kept in full sun. If we shear the other way, where you actually cut the shears into the shrub, and by the way, that's an actually a very easy thing to do, you're going to find that these lower branches die out, so make a conscious effort as you're running the head shears to always make sure it's angled out. Doesn't need to be much, maybe 10 or 20 degrees. And as you're going along, that base should always be wider than the top. Really, your hedges should be more A-shaped than V-shaped, as most people commonly do. Once you've got the basic outline done with the good electric shears, it's time then to go back with the hand shears. And it really takes both to make the hedges look just right. After the basic shape is set, just go through with the hand shears and cut it back a little bit more. The general rule to shearing hedges like this is to let the plant grow out about two to three inches and then remove about half that new growth. So some plants, such as boxwood, you might be shearing two or three times a year. Other plants, you might only need to shear once because they don't grow as much. We can shear throughout the summer, but no matter what plant you're shearing, Try to get this work done by about August 15th. After that, you're finished with shearing for the year because any shearing after that may result in new growth that will actually get frosted out by our winter. So during the month of July and early August, get out there and do a little head shearing. This is the time to do it. Thank you for that information, John. It's amazing how you can be here and there at the same time. Well, I just ran over and did that. Did you know? <laughs> Good job. So. Changed my, <laughs> all right, changed my shirt and everything. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we appreciate that. So, Okay, coming right back to you here, though, John. Um, we had a collar on uh, lilacs. They trimmed it to the ground as advised last spring. It grew last, last year four feet tall. This year it leafed out, grew two inches, then died. Any ideas what maybe happened to that? No, because that's pretty unusual and not related to what they, uh, what they, how they pruned. Volga. Uh, Volga. That's huh? where they're from. Yes. You know what? That would be a good one to look at. 
Uh, so make sure I get that afterwards, and okay. I'll stop by and take a look. At, one of the things that could be, and I've seen this on occasion, we can get the lilac bore mm -hmm. in those young, young succulent stems, and that might have done it. There's also bacterial wilt, which we saw a real problem with last mm -hmm. year. But we usually don't see symptoms of that for, uh, for a little bit. So that's a good puzzler. I'll take a look at it. I've okay. got lilacs in my yard that did pretty much the same thing, but I think it was just too wet. Well, and that's the other problem, too. That'll be sight. And, uh, you know, I've seen that. I even had some cottonwoods die in my yard that were two years old just because it's just too wet. And we hate to sound like a broken record, but mm -hmm. if your ground squishes, it doesn't have to be standing water, your ground squishes. That explains a lot of problems this year. Just too wet. Uh, pressure. Dave, strawberries, all-star variety, always been a great producer. This year, lots of blooms, but no fruit at all. Any idea why? Well, if you're having good flowering, uh, the next step in, after the flowering is the pollination part, so maybe John can address that a little bit himself, but I'm guessing they just didn't have very good pollination this year. Any ideas there, John? Well, that would be my guess, too, is that for whatever reason, just missed the pollinators, either a timing issue or... Hopefully they didn't put anything on them that killed off any pollinators that were there, but of course without knowing that information I wouldn't want to speculate on that either. They indicate no herbicides, well they said herbicides here have been sprayed in the area, okay. which is actually for weed control, but right. maybe they right. were talking about insecticide. Another possibility is a frost. Mm -hmm. If they got a frost during bloom time that could have damaged those flowers and that's why they didn't get any fruit sets. So we'd have to kind of think back and say, gee, did they get you know, any frost on the roof or any time during that period, and that may also explain it. Because that's what happened to the apple trees at my place. Yep. I mean, we hit, we had that frost, every blossom gone, yep. and we won't see fruit this year. So. Well, the other thing that did happen with some of the fruit trees here around Brookings, anyway, is that the normal bee pollinators that were out for them came out at about the right time, but of course the trees weren't blooming at that point. Yeah. And so then when the trees were blooming, then those common pollinators were gone, and I don't know if that would be a case that might have happened here with the strawberries or not, but it's, it's a possibility, I think. Okay. Uh, comes to us from Bone Steel by Nebraska, choke cherry tree, and this may be a John John question here. <laughs> it started to set fruit, then dried up, and now something is eating or putting holes in the leaves. Any idea what it might be and what to spray or question mark is all they have. What's going on? There's a, uh, there's a couple of things, but most likely what there's, the holes were not made by an insect but by a disease. Uh, we have a, a couple of fungal, fungal diseases that actually cause the tissue to die and then drop out. And so on cherries, particularly this time of year, people say, well, there's holes in my cherry, but I didn't see anything eating them. Nothing did, but if they'd looked at them earlier, they would have found these brown spots on the leaves that just about correlate to that. Uh, and generally speaking, it's anything we, we spray for or manage for, especially in choke cherries. Uh, the, why the holes are there and, and objectionable, we don't like to look at them. They really don't have much of an effect on fruit production. Okay. Now this one, they, they talked about holes, but is, is this the time of the year where you, we start to see the netting or just the veining? From the uh, pear slug yeah. type? It's usually just a little bit later than this, and with things later. being as late as what they are, I was out, looked at a number of plums uh, in the last week here, and I didn't find any pear slugs, so I'd be surprised if we would see many yeah, pear slugs out We still have 10 caterpillars out on them, so yeah. So, yeah the, the holes, though, are, are usually due to a fungus. Okay. From Yankton, Dave Asparagus, when should you stop cutting it for the season? Well, you can gauge it a couple things. Uh, I kind of I love asparagus, but I get tired of it after having it just about every meal. So we stopped having it for breakfast now. We're just trying to <laughs> concentrate on supper once in a while. But you can kind of gauge it by the size of the, the, the shoots that you're getting. If the, the shoots are still coming up and they got a good size, you can still continue to harvest it. But I'd say you probably want to cut that off by about the first part of July or so. Let those shoots grow up and get full size for the rest of the season. That's going to recharge that plant, store up a lot of carbohydrates to get good size shoot production next year. Okay. This one comes to us uh, from uh, Newcastle, Wyoming. And uh, on the west slope of the Black Hills, they have potato beetles and grasshoppers. I are wondering if you had some insight as far as control for that, John. That can be a real challenge. That's... Uh pretty good duo going in the potatoes there. Um, you know, for, for grasshopper control, one of the long-term chemicals that has been used in gardens and in other situations is uh, seven. 
Unfortunately for a lot of our potato beetles now, they show a fair amount of resistance to seven. So if you're trying to control both of them with a single chemical, you may be out of luck in, in, a, in that respect. i be honest, I guess I haven't tried looking to see what's out for control of both of them, but if you can avoid some of those that you know you might have some resistance issues on there, a single chemical application could help control both of them. Grasshoppers are likely to keep coming back in during the year, though. Okay. We're going to go to uh, another one of our email questions that came in. Uh, and these are, uh, well, they look like spruce trees here, uh, John. Colorado bl uh, blue spruce that recently completed blooming, but several of the new shoots are starting to wilt and fall off. I've enclosed a few pictures of their conditioning and condition and was wondering what your thoughts were on this. I did not want to start taking action until I knew for sure what was occurring on the tree. Your thoughts would be greatly appreciated. Also, what is the best way to remove anthracnose from an autumn blaze maple tree? I planted them three weeks ago and several of the leaves are already showing signs of disease and a few on top have completely fallen off. So two different kind of questions, but all the pictures we have, I believe, are on the spruce. Okay, where was this again? This was, um, it did not say in this one, so okay. you this, picked a location. Yeah, <laughs> anywhere South Dakota. Yeah. All right, well, it, it, almost anywhere in South Dakota, we are seeing this on blue spruce. And in many areas of the state, we had that brief two-day time period of extremely hot weather just as spruce were breaking bud in many areas of the state. That's why I asked for location. And what happened is these actually wilted and browned right out. Uh, and we even had people, we had to let people know this is not herbicide because people were saying, oh my goodness, somebody sprayed. Quite often you could find this along the entire line of a shelter belt, for example. And so uh, this is not fatal uh, because generally speaking, a lot of the tips survive it, but a few don't. And uh, they'll notice that it doesn't continue this spring or summer, but uh, it's just one of those seasonal things that every now and then we see and, and not to worry. As far as the anthracnose, there's nothing you can do about it now. Uh, these trees were recently transplanted on top of that, so it may be some other factors going on as well. Um, nothing I would suggest spraying, nothing you need to spray. Uh, just make sure if it dries out that the trees are watered uh, for the first year and, and life goes on. And let's hope we have a normal spring, whatever that is in South Dakota. Okay. Uh, from winter, Dave, uh, the local master gardeners recently transplanted some daylilies at the old schoolhouse at the museum. Someone other than us cut the tops <laughs> off without asking professional gardeners. Will this harm them and will they bloom yet this year? Well, certainly cutting the tops off those plants is going to set them back somewhat, but um, it's not uncommon if you're transplanting fully leafed out plants to cut back that foliage a little bit just to give them a better chance to get reestablished again. So depending on how far they cut it back, if they cut it down to just a little nub, that's certainly going to de you know, decrease the chance of having flowering this summer. But uh, daylilies is another one of those tough, tough perennials that you can just about throw them out in the, in the yard and they're going to grow without even planting them. So I wouldn't be too upset about it, but you're probably not going to see as many flowers this year as you'd like. Okay. This one comes to us from Lake Preston, John, Paul. All right. They have young trees planted last year, linden, maple, swampy oak, hackberry, and they put mulch around that. Uh, Minnesota oak is where it came from, I guess, the, the mulch. Uh, now the trees are stressed and dying. Did I put too mulch on, too much mulch on, or too close? Uh, they took up some of the mulch the last day or two, uh, and would that mulch perhaps cause this? But you know, I doubt if the mulch caused it in the sense of the mulch. But we normally don't want mulch more than two to four inches deep. If it's deeper than that, that can be a problem. We usually like to keep it away from the trunk, too. But let's go back to our continual complaints since last year, and that's rain, 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 rain. And one of the problems they've seen, and it was a study done by Iowa, of all places, for all our Iowa fans, uh, that they looked at it and found that if you're using an organic mulch, a wood chip mulch, that actually holds more moisture than a rock mulch. And in poorly drained sites, they actually showed that a, that a rock mulch was actually better. Uh, Jeff Isles did the work. And uh, uh, it might be, without seeing the site, the fact that it's just been too damp. And uh, that, I mean, people, people forget, unless they've been listening to their sump pump like I have for the last, <laughs> what, 12 months, it never shed off. 
uh, that uh, once that rain started last June, it has not stopped in many areas of the state, and our soils have just been continually wet. And that's probably the problem, and the mulch may not have helped. Okay. So they said they brought the, or took the mulch up in the last couple of days. Is there any signs that as they're taking that mulch up that might indicate that it was way too wet? Other than you mentioned the soggy soil or... Uh, if there's fish. Fish. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it's no, been so it wet it would be hard to tell. Hard but. to tell if the mulch yeah. caused yeah. that. Okay. Uh, we'll go, we're going to go back to a few more of our email type questions. Um, this one comes to us from Hot Springs. After a rain Sunday night, we had these tiny little worms, more like little snakes in the flower bed. They're moving around like snakes. Uh, they're uh, about as thick as a heavy sewing thread, three to four inches long. John Keekafer, you have any idea what we might be looking at here? These are one of those classic things that I thought were great fun as a kid, and I'm still kind of fascinated by them, honestly. These are horsehair worms, and these are intestinal parasites in crickets and grasshoppers, primarily. Most of these that we see in this area are parasites of crickets and they live inside the cricket and people will occasionally step on one of those crickets and then they'll say, well, it's guts came wriggling out and really it's not the guts at all, it's this horsehair worm. They got their name because they do complete their life cycle in water and the old story was that um, when people would see them swimming in the horse tanks and stock ponds and things like that, that a horsehair had come to life. That's kind of what they look like and so they got their name horsehair worm from that. No other relationship to horses, but they do complete that development in water, and so they're in some of those situations. Uh, no harm to anything except the crickets. They do tend to render, render them sterile, so the crickets are unable to reproduce and have more little crickets, but uh, for humans, they're no risk at all and just kind of one of those curiosities. Uh, create more curiosity than really any harm to anything. So. Right, except the crickets. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, this comes to us from Sioux Falls, and last week, or two weeks ago actually, we talked a little bit about slugs, and with the moisture we're having, they're, they're going to start to show up. And they had a number of things that they wanted to discuss and comments they made about slugs. Uh, last fall, uh, when they uh, dug up their potatoes, they found that they had a heavy infestation of the slugs on those. Uh, they've used some, some methyl, uh, say that again for me, John. Methaldehyde? Methaldehyde, yes, there All we right. go. Iron phosphate, sand, and beer traps to try to control these. In my, in my readings, I found that slugs do all sorts of damage to gardens as well, and that the slugs apparently relish new seed sprouts. Um, I'm wondering if the panelists think that slugs can cause extensive problems. I have described uh, earlier on here. Uh, any thoughts as far as uh, other methods of control or one more effective than the other, and they have a number of graphics there for us to look at. So, Right, and you know, I think this person did a great job of summarizing some of the, the products that are out there and, and ways to try to control these. You know, the big commercial products, the baits that are used are metaldehyde and iron phosphate. Some people have great luck with the, the beer traps where you put out a saucer of a fermenting product and it pulls the slugs in and hopefully they drown in it. and. Uh, you're done with some of those slugs anyway and some people report very little success with those so if it's working for you absolutely keep doing it and and uh, enjoy the success with it the sand products that get mentioned uh, in this case it was a, a blasting type sand uh, used for prepping metals and things like that and the idea is that it's sharp and that slugs don't like to cross that I've heard some people using diatomaceous earth which are the little uh, glass shells of creatures and same theory on that I'm never sure how well some of those work because if you've ever played around with a snail or a slug and just for the fun of doing it I guess you can uh, have them cross a razor blade and they just slide right across that razor blade and nothing happens to them. So I, I'm not sure how much damage some of these other products would do to them. I think they're pretty impervious to them but again if it's working, if it seems to keep them away then no harm in using those products by any means. Okay. Now, we, we know that grubs and earthworms work pretty well for fishing bait. Do slugs work for, for that at all? I would guess not. Uh, okay. In some cases they may, but especially the larger slugs, if you handle them and molest them a little bit, you'll find that they start exuding this really nasty thick slime. And it's a protective type thing, and I would 
think that it would repel fish as well and you wouldn't have much luck with it. Okay. That was a follow-up question that had come in with that. So. <laughs> uh, this one comes to us from uh, Dalton. Uh, question about ash trees, and I believe we have some graphics on this one too as well. Uh, they were uh, here uh, when they moved in to a farm about 20 years ago. Around the base of most of them, it, it looks like there was some damage from being hit by the mower. Uh, so that may have opened up some of the areas for disease or insects. As the pictures show, it looks like some kind of insect is making their way inside and around. Since I haven't heard about the emerald ash borer in South Dakota, I'm hoping it's something different. Uh, any thoughts, John, on this particular tree? Yeah, there is. But, you know, my, my first thing is I'm still trying to imagine John saying playing with slugs by putting them on razor blades. <laughs> i, I got to hear about that later because that's not my idea of entertainment. But yeah, what the try these things at least once. All right. <laughs> that would be it. But uh, on to their question with, uh, with this tree, and, and, and it is not the emerald ash borer. Uh, the emerald ash borer would have a small D-shaped hole. Uh, these are rather appear to be rather large holes and rounded, and there's two insects that'll make those: the clear wing ash borer and carpenter worm. Now they're both insects that are native to South Dakota. They do a lot of damage to trees at about that size. In fact, as they get a little bit bigger than that, I tend to find more carpenter worm damage than I do uh, uh, clear wing ash ash borers. Usually, in a tree that size, they aren't going to kill it, but you'll find a fair amount of branch dieback. For both those insects, they can be treated. But for that, it has to be a bark spray. The products that you pour around the base of the tree will not work on these Lepidopter insects uh, because the, in this case, the adult is a moth, not a beetle. So we really passed the window for treatments this year. Um, yeah, we pretty much passed it. Um, but uh, next spring, about mid-May, they could apply bark application of of a uh, fungicide, or excuse me, of an insecticide labeled for these, and they probably could clear it up. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us from southwest Minnesota. We were talking about slugs just a little bit ago. What they've noticed is all this, a lot of slugs at night on the sides of their house and the apron that goes around their house and so on. They've never seen this in 20 years happening before, and just asking if the conditions are different or unique to cause that this year. So um, I guess that's really their question, John, and if that could cause right. any issues or problems with their siding. But. Well, it's not likely to cause any issues or problems with the siding. Uh, you know, and I guess I didn't really touch on it with that last slug question that we had. The question was if they, in that one too, if they tend to affect young shoot growth more than some of the older plants. They definitely do. They like that more tender plant growth, that, that newer growth, uh, where the leaves aren't as old and don't have as many chemicals in them that might help protect those plants. Same thing here, they're going to go after that newer plant growth. They certainly wouldn't be eating siding, but um, just the weather conditions in general are going to favor slug survival and, and development here. And they really need that moist condition to, to keep themselves moist as well. And as long as we have these moist conditions in this area, we're likely to see relatively high slug populations. And any place that's a little bit shady and protected, they'll make themselves right to home. Okay. This one comes from Canton, uh, Dave. Uh, my apple trees, or John, I guess, uh, Bob, my apple trees did not bloom this year, but yet my pear trees have many pears starting to grow. I've talked to others in the area who have also have uh, apple trees that did not bloom. Is there a reason for this, uh, the, or is it just resting for a year? Well, it could be two things. I mean, we do have apples that are alternate bearing, but they also tend to bloom a little off from pears. And I think it's probably looking at the frost, don't you, Dave? I agree, yeah. We've had, last year was terrible for me. I lost one apple tree and had a lot of damage on several apple trees, and my pear trees got pretty damaged, too. I don't have much for pear trees left, but those late spring frosts can be a real problem with, with flowers, yep. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us from Rapid City. When I use grass clippings in my garden and around my trees, do I need to add nitrogen to them? I have heard that it, help, it leaches out the nitrogen, and I need to add extra. If it's just grass clippings, you probably don't have to worry about adding anything. If you're doing more of a leaves and straw, sawdust, bark chips, that kind of thing, maybe then you might need some. But for just plain grass clippings, it should be fine. And, and the biggest factor is as long as you're leaving it on top of the soil, you, that's less of a problem. Well, the real problem would get is if they incorporated it into the soil. So now we have decaying material in the ground itself. 
Okay. This one comes from Sioux Falls. They have peonies at the cemetery <clears throat> that are well established, uh, but the grass keeps creeping in. And she's been told perhaps landscape fi uh, fi fabric fiber or mulch may help with that. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a good idea. Again, it's going to be a little challenging to get the, the grass out of there. you got to work kind of carefully around those stems, but now is probably not a bad time to try to get in there and get that out. The stems have pretty much hardened up for the season, and they're doing well. So try to work that grass out, get it carefully dug out with a small trowel, or pull it out, and then get some mulch down there around the plants. And again, as John said earlier, just two or three inches of mulch or so is probably going to be sufficient and I wouldn't put it too heavy right over the top of where those stems are going to come out because it's going to be a little difficult for some of those to push through that. And, and I would use just the mulch, not the fabric yeah, and the I mulch. Agree. You know, I, I've seen too many places where they end up pulling out the fabric because of all the grass that starts on top of the fabric. Mm -hmm. So just the mulch layer would be enough. Okay. So use the mulch but not the fabric. Correct. Okay. More so. so. All right. Well, thank you, panelists. And that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. And now it's time to wrap up, and we want to thank our panel of experts, John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator. David Graper, SDSU Horticulture Department Head and Extension Horticulturalist. And John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Brookings Area Master Gardeners. And thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership in the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting and by Swiftel Communications.